Okay, thanks very much. So I, uh, I did have managed to have a shave today. I forgot to bring my razor. I walked to find a shop called Wardgreaves, I think, and I went the wrong way. And I ended up asking a man, that, uh, does, could he tell me where Wardgreaves was? Wardgreaves, I think it is. And he said, uh, he looked me up and down. I was a bit misshaven and I hadn't quite changed yet. And he said, are you looking for a job? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was so taken aback, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I didn't say anything. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about uh, our monograph of uh, Ipomoea. Uh, this is it. came out a couple of years ago now. came out the day that uh, the university went into the first lockdown in the UK. So we didn't get to have the big party and I didn't get to give the talk and, uh, that I was uh, planning on giving. And I must apologise for the dramatic nature of unleashing the power of global natural history collections. I think I'm the only taxonomist left in the UK university system. So when, I, when I'm out and about giving talks, I usually have to build it up. So I'm often unleashing the power of global natural history collections. I should have dulled that down coming to a serious botanical institution like Missouri, who uh, I'm sure understand that. But um, I think uh, what I'm really uh, um, systematics is uh, concerned with four fundamental questions. And those four questions are at the heart of our monograph. Faced with any specimen, you want to know what is it? Um, what is it related to? Where does it live? And how, and how, old, how old is it or what age it is? And those are broadly equivalent to taxonomy, phylogeny, biogeography, and time-calibrated phylogenies. And what taxonomists do in the, a very basic core level is answer for those four questions about any species anywhere. And by putting all that information together in a global comprehensive format, one of the things that you get is you get a lot more than you do if you don't do the taxonomy. I think that's one of my central messages. So there's a lot of phylogeny reconstruction going on. There's a lot of that, driven by molecular sequence data. There's a lot of biogeography going on, driven by molecular sequence data. And there's a lot of time calibrated phylogenies going on, um, related to uh, also related to phylogeny. This bit here, though, the difficult bit, the really tricky bit, the bit that most of the tropical flora still demands, most tropical genera plants have never been monographed, often gets lost, missed out because of lots and lots of reasons. Lack of expertise, the time it takes, all of those sorts of things. So one of the things we were keen to do is have this right at the heart of our project. And then we were going to do these other things, but with this as a focus. So we ended up with a, a fantastic phylogeny, but we had no time did we set out to build a phylogeny. At no time did we set out to do those other things. Um, we set out to sort the taxonomy out, and we got all of that for free, almost, because of the way we did it. And that's what I'm going to describe. So just a few uh, slides on. Uh, why I got into uh, uh, tropical botany. These are acanthaceae pollen grains. I spent my three years at the British Museum in the basement uh, using their scanning electron microscope. They had just bought a new microscope at the time, and these are all acanthaceae. This is um, Sympagus, that's Phlogacanthus, Strobilanthus, Petalidium, Whitfieldia, Lancasteria, Poikilacanthus. So they're incredibly diagnostic and taxon specific to individual species and genera. And every day when I went to the microscope, I would acetylize 16 samples one day, then the next day I would go to the, um, I would go to the microscope and I would, um, I would scan the images. And I never knew what I was going to see because people had done some studies on acanthaceae pollen, but they were so uh, but they've never really looked at them across the whole level of variation and took decent pictures of them. My PhD was followed by some taxonomic studies 
uh, funded by the Royal Society on the genus, the Asian genus Strobilanthus. This is my first tr field trip in Sri Lanka. This is Strobilanthus anceps here, described in the flora of British India as a two and a half feet sub, sub shrub. Here's me holding it, uh, it's 15 feet high, uh, woody, scrambling up through the other uh, uh, vegetation. On that same field trip, we went to look for this thing, Strobilanthus punctata. Uh, there was known from a walker specimen in 1850, and Alston uh, collected it in 1926, and that was all that was known. No, no flower color, no fruits, and, um, and then we, we refound it, and fruit and flowers, and, uh, and um, some silica gel, and, uh, and, the, and the rest. During the Strobilantha study, uh, 60 new species were described. And one of the things we noticed then is that fifth, half of them had been collected by the same man, uh, the great Frank Kingdom Ward, uh, in the 1950s. And they had been sitting in herbaria for 50, 60, 70, 80 years until we came along and, and described them as new. So there were many, many species. Oh, excuse me. There were many species that uh, had been sitting in cupboards just waiting for, for someone to come along and identify them. That led to, to this paper and uh, uh, thousands of plant species undiscovered in cupboards. And this was making a paper out of something that people had known for a long time, that most species aren't discovered in the field. They're discovered in herbarium cabinets. They're discovered because you need to know the ones that have been discovered already. You need to be familiar with what those ones look like, and you need to compare a new specimen with those, speci with those uh, other species. So they're discovered in collections by people who are experts in those groups. So surprisingly, only 14% of specimens are described within five years of being collected. And on average, it's about 35 years. These are all the type specimens for Strobilanthus, 35 years. And this has been shown again and again since our study, and uh, also true for, for animals. Specimens get collected, they go into the cupboards, and then they sit there and wait till someone comes and sort of works on that particular group. I always had the idea of monographing a monograph. So a monograph is a big comprehensive study, taxonomic revision. And I wanted to, and what people claim is that that's the best, most accurate way of doing taxonomy. And I wanted to do a study where you evaluated whether that was true or not. So this is a study of the genus Aframormum by two ex-Oxford students. It's a monograph. It came out about two years ago. And there were 4,000 specimens. And this is the, this is 2000, this is now, this is the first specimen being collected back in the 1800s. And these are the 4,000 specimens uh, that were collected over time from all the African herbaria. So the study was done in Edinburgh. They gathered all the specimens together and they wrote the monograph and described 61 new species, 20 of which were new. And what my student did, it was a thankless task as a PhD project, is she went through all 4,000 uh, specimens and she documented the history of each specimen from the moment it was collected to the moment someone put a name on it and then the next name and then the next name and then a different name, and then maybe a different genus. So we had 4,000 specimens documented for every specimen's history. And what you might think in taxonomic groups is that the information gradually accumulates in a steady way in which we go from zero information to 100% of the information. What actually happens over time is something very different to that. So here is the same 4,000 specimens, and here are synonyms, here are misidentified invalid names, and here are, uh, in this pale green color, is specimens that only were named to the genus or family that had no name. So at the time the monograph was done, this green color here is an accurate name, and at the time the monograph was done, we assume, and it is an assumption, that all 61 species and the 4,000 specimens had the correct name. But 58% of them had an incorrect name when the monograph was written. So these are 
specimens, 4,000, all in various bits of the herbaria. The taxonomic enterprise is going on over time, and the specimens in various herbaria are in a bit of a mass. And it's actually much worse than that, because you don't know which 42% is correct until you do the monograph. So what you come to with a taxonomic group is you come to lists of things, lots of names, lots of synonyms, lots of misidentifieds, a whole gamut of things that stop you just making, uh, making sort of an entry into trying to sort out a taxonomic revision. And that's why one of the th reasons why people uh, don't uh, um, attempt them. Uh, so the headline here was, wasn't what we were setting out to do, was half the world's natural history collections have got the, an incorrect name. And I think that's probably uh, an underestimated kind of thing. So tropical plants are poorly known, poorly understood. How do we go about documenting that? The so one way to do it, and it's the main way that it's been done, is regional floristic accounts in a country or in a particular area. And this is where most of our knowledge and information about the natural world has come from. It's an extraordinary contribution of floristic taxonomists. But it's not perfect. So it's regional or country based. It's often based on species delimitation. This is the real core of the taxonomic enterprise. It's usually time limited because the funds are limited. And it's based on short descriptions and keys. Not no phylogeny, no illustrations, the bare bones of what is it. You can contrast that to comprehensive monographs. That's of the type that Darwin spent nine years monographing the barnacle before writing the, uh, the origin of species. Willie Hennig spent a long time mono doing monographic taxonomic work before writing uh, phylogenetic systematics, the book that became Phylogenetics and Cladistics. Lars Brundin spent a long time uh, monographing chromonoid midges before he came up with the idea of vicariant biogeography. So this is a sort of slightly different group of people who are interested in looking at variation across not just countries or regions but the whole, wherever the organisms are, that's where they look because they can get a much more comprehensive view of morphological variation and uh, the answer to those four basic questions. And it's based on species delimitation. It's often long term, the whole career of a particular person, comprehensive studies, including a whole bunch of things. So what we wanted to do with our what we ended up calling foundation monographs is that how could we speed up and have the practicality of doing floristics but with the comprehensiveness of monographs and not get stuck in some of, the, some, of the, some of the detail. So we came up with this concept of foundation monographs. It's based on species delimitation, but we're going to try and do it in five years. Um, it was based on looking at the variation of species across the, the entire world, although we ended up monographing just the ones in the new world, but we very much looked at the ones, it was just because of the size of the thing and uh, the open access charges that we had to pay for this was $9,000. Um, so, um, yeah, we couldn't afford to do the, the, uh, the whole lot. But, uh, and we were going to uh, do a study where we we're going to integrate molecular sequence data in the taxonomic workflow and try and see if we could, uh, if that would help us speed it up. So the genus we picked was Epimia. It's in uh, Convolvulaceae. Uh, at the time we started, that was this uncertainty about how many species there might be. Uh, never been monographed, uh, it's a tropical group, pantropical. Um, there may be 2,000, 4, 4, uh, 250,000 specimens in the world, Herbaria, that's a way underestimate, there'll be a lot more than that. One of the things you have to th think about is how do you sample that? How do you, you know, you can't get all the specimens to Oxford and then start working on it. You have to start selecting specimens and <coughs> herbaria and people who have worked on them before, people you trust, people you don't trust, all of those sorts of issues about trying to, s trying to select a sample uh, to look at the variation. Uh, the taxonomy was extremely poor and it had two uh, economically important plants, the Kangkong, Ipomia aquatica, uh, like a spinach substitute in Asia, 
uh, and the sweet potato, Ipomoea, Ipomoea batatas. So just to show you what these things look like, that's your typical Ipomoea, um, the climbers. Uh, there's also trailers, uh, they uh, grow along the ground. There's a bunch of 12 or 13 trees in, in Mexico, uh, Ipomoeas, but uh, just taking the tree form. And there's also in the Cerrado, uh, there's um, a shrub, uh, shrubby sort of, uh, often on a single stem, erect sort of woody, woody types. And the calyx ends up being an extraordinarily important character for Ipomoea. Uh, so we spent a lot of time looking at calyces. That turned out to be quite important relative to finding the progenitor of the sweet potato, uh, which we did, uh, but more of that, uh, more of that later. Um, just to show you what these things look like in, uh, on herbarium specimens relative to, to, to collections. Uh, this is granite cola. So one of the things that happens with monographs is you, you do the study and then it provides not the last word by any means. There's been maybe 10 species described since it came out two years ago. Uh, but people have a framework now. There's country uh, keys uh, for every country in South America and uh, Central America. Uh, so people have got a framework now. You find any specimen in the new world and you've got a chance of knowing whether it's new because you're coming to a system not that's in chaos, the synonymy and all of that. That's all been taken care of. We did that. But you've got a really good chance of knowing have I got a new one or how does my thing fit into this sort of, uh, this sort of context. Um, so what we did is... Uh, uh, so here we are, uh, existing data, and this is the mess that you have. So, um, and, uh, so before we started, one of the things we worried about is, I mean, if you're doing, uh, so we did a small pilot study. We monographed the genus Convolvulus, which is the temperate equivalent of Ebermia. And uh, it's 194 species, and we wanted to see how much we could do in a year, maybe 18 months. Could we do the descriptions? Because if you're doing 194 species, a year and a half, that's uh, 75, 75 weeks. Uh, so you're doing two or three species a week. If you're writing descriptions, you're sorting the synonymy out, you're getting the illustrations, you're done and all of that. Three species a week and then you're going full tilt. That's no holidays, no off at Christmas, no off of that. So it's probably five, six a week just to get the bare bones, the written descriptions and all of that. Um, so we did produce that, there were five new species. It's a temperate group, so it was much better known. But it sort of showed us, and we learned quite a few lessons for this. From this, we downloaded all the names. There were lots and lots of them, we got a bit stuck. So we didn't do that for Ipomoea, where we did it in a slightly different way. And our uh, paper in Nature Plants, uh, this one here came out in 19, um, has a 50 page supplementary information about what we, the nuts and bolts of the taxonomic process. That's kind of coming out as a sort of technical piece in the Q bulletin about how to write a monograph. So it's uh, a lot of the detail is in there. So we had existing data, and then we had this workflow here. We had someone doing the specimen level uh, um, uh, shuffling uh, of specimens, and then we had lab work. We had a ITS DNA barcode phylogeny. That's here of 2,000 specimens, and then we had some whole genome sequence, uh, we had uh, um, uh, uh, NGS, uh, 600, gene, 600 genes we sequenced and had whole chloroplast genomes. So we had a huge amount of data and we sort of reciprocally illuminated those two data sets. I'll explain more about how we did that in a second. So the data we had was specimens from 70, 47 herbaria. There was field work by one of the group in Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, and Paraguay. We've had a long series of projects in Bolivia. Uh, so we've been well set up there for uh, 20 years or so. Um, the Natural History Museum, Q, Edinburgh, and Naturalis let us sequence their whole collections, uh, which we did. Uh, there were herbarium visits to all of those herbaria in the UK and Europe and South America and North America. And in the end, we sequenced 3,335 sequences. This is, uh, that was uh, most of this, what ended up being an ITS tree. Um, we started sequencing two chloroplast markers and ITS, and we ended up just sequencing that. And we also had 384 whole chloroplast genomes, 
and the same number of specimens for 605 single copy nuclear genes. So we had a massive data set. We just caught the beginning of the NGS thing and uh, we had a huge, uh, huge amount of, uh, of sequence data. So these were the specimens that we sequenced from, uh, and we couldn't have done that without Herbaria. You know, they were all from those 47 Herbaria, but uh, extraordinary range of uh, geographical separation of those things that uh, just uh, made possible because of uh, uh, curation and people looking after specimens. So this is our tree, and um, this is the barcode phylogeny here of 2,000, uh, 2000 specimens. That's in black. And then there's uh, specimens in red is the NGS, uh, NGS 600, gene, uh, 600 gene tree. So we had a two-tier sort of sequencing strategy. Uh, and uh, so let me just give you some detail on that. So this is based on a single marker ITS. It's, uh, it's uh, most phylogeneticists would absolutely laugh at it now. Um, and uh, it was extraordinarily useful for our project. Um, the NGS usually gets done all at one hit. What we were able to do in ITS is just sequence as we went along. So we were adding to it all the time. And if you've got any specimen anywhere in the wo in Ipomoea in the world now, you can sequence it and put it in our tree. It's not a great tree. It's got lots of faults with it. ITS is a small bit of DNA. You don't get any bootstrap support. Uh, it's probably an inaccurate tree. Um, turned out it was fairly accurate by comparison to the NGS, you know, 600 gene tree. But this is how we used it. We used it with caution and congruence, I'm saying here. We used it, we didn't use it to make any decisions on its own. So we, there were lots of species that we sequenced multiple specimens of that we thought this is a species and it had multiple specimens and we sequenced it and it came out as monophyletic on the tree. So these are species that we thought that delimited based on morphology. We sequenced multiple accessions and they came out as natural groups or monophyletic taxa on the tree. So 60% of the time, species we were delimiting using morphology were monophyletic on the tree, just using the IPS tree. There was other occasions when the, um, if you look at the green box with the blue and red taxa, so this is two species that we thought there was only one. And the blue and the red, the red is one species, the blue is the other. And it's a bit of a mess in there. But the blue and the reds are monophyletic on the tree and they're all intermingled. And we took that as evidence that what we thought is that this is one species and therefore we recognize it as one. There was other situations of misidentifications. 40%, 50% of the world's natural history collections have got an incorrect name or and there's a huge amount of misidentifications in it. So when we sequenced, and we were sequencing lots and lots of specimens, so routinely something would have a name and it would pop up in completely the wrong place and we'd go back and have a look. And uh, So it was incredibly useful for that. It was also very useful when we didn't have a clue. We had a flower, we had a couple of leaves on a specimen and we weren't sure. We just didn't really know. And then we'd put it into the ITS tree and then you'd look at the specimens it was coming out close to and you, you'd make some judgment based on that. This is an example of one species, Ipomoea squamosa, and uh, we sequenced uh, 10 specimens, and some of them came out in this part of Ipomoea, and four of them came out in the completely other end of Ipomoea. These specimens were pretty identical. They were slightly geographically delimited if you were using geography as a taxonomic character. But these four specimens in Cryptica was two things, one at one end of Ipomoea and one at the other end, and it was the ITS tree that gave us, uh, gave us some indication of that. And we continued with that because it was so useful, because it was so cheap, because it was so practical, and we were just uh, using it as a sort of, using it as a taxonomic character. So taxonomic characters like an ovary or the number of stamens are useful in some groups, but not in others. Some places it can be the diagnostic character of species and sorting bits out, and in other places it's completely redundant. And we used the ITS tree a bit like that. In some bits of the phylogeny, it was really useful. And in other bits, we just ignored it, just as we would do for any, uh, any other. 
So this is uh, results. Uh, it was a, uh, uh, a comprehensive monograph, and uh, its comprehensive nature means that you can have a shot at identifying anything in the new world. Uh, there were 17 new species described. This is uh, a relative of the sweet potato, Epimia lactifera. I mean, these are big. These were big plants, very distinct. We weren't looking. We were all lumpers, if anything. Uh, so these were very, you know, big diagnostic, uh, very distinct uh, 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 species. And um, there was a number. That everything was described. There was 257 new illustrations. We got 40,000 pounds from one of the research councils in the UK to to illustrate all the all the new species and much else besides. And uh, we have a website, and uh, and uh, yeah. So it was an incredible success because when we started, we didn't know whether we were going to fall flat on our faces. We thought, are we trying to bite off too much here? Are we going to fall? Is this uh, much too ambitious? And uh, it wasn't. So I just want to go through very quickly now five examples of things that are mo that we learned by doing the monograph. So the first one was if you compare our monograph to the previous, the, the recent checklist for Bolivia uh, we contributed to, so the one before that in 58, uh, had 34 species of Epimia, 12 of those are synonyms, um, and then there are 200, before the monograph, we wrote the first paper on Epimia uh, from Bolivia, and we recognized 102 species, five-fold increase from what was done, what was known <coughs> in 1960. Uh, 18 of those were new, and uh, we've in the monograph, uh, in the years from 2015 to 2019, there were, we published another four species. And there's probably another 10 maybe published since, quite a few by us and quite a few by people, uh, particularly in Brazil. So the increase has been quite extraordinary in terms of the level of information that we've managed to, to improve. So this is a phylogeny of Ipomoea with Bolivia in blue. Don't take, uh, um, the, the green ones are, is Bolivia, but the, uh, uh, is the new species. So the colored uh, triangles, uh, rectangles uh, around the phylogeny uh, are, are Bolivia. And the reason you can't really sort out Ipomoea in Bolivia is because of certain species that are more closely related to things in Ecuador and Brazil. And uh, so Bolivia has been assembled polyphyletically uh, with relatives in various other countries. And if you really want to get the species boundaries uh, as accurate as possible, then you can't do it by just looking at the Bolivian specimens or the Brazilian specimens or any of those other groups. You have to be looking at their close relatives to get the boundaries right, and those close relatives are usually in other 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 countries. This is the phylogeny of Ipomoea again, and in black here are all the specimens that we sequenced that had a new name as a result of the monographic study. So, 40% of the spe 2,000 specimens we sequenced and many others that we didn't sequence, about 40% had the incorrect, inaccurate, or had a different name at the end, of, the end of the project. So when people are talking about sequencing every eukaryote on Earth, uh, and there's many, many projects doing that sort of thing, then given our state of knowledge of the big groups, the insects and the tropical flowering plants, then that's a sort of tall order. Uh, because many, many specimens are going to be sequenced, are going to have be, be so poorly known uh, to... Uh, um so, uh, forgive me just by way of introduction. So, w one of the things I do for undergraduates is I often... This is stuck to a herbarium specimen, but I often... This is the fruit of Delonyx regia and I usually wave it in front of undergraduates and ask them what it is. <laughs> so what's this? And they say, uh, it's a musical instrument, is what, what they usually say. And, uh, and the point I've been, I try and make are two points. One, that the meaning, meaning in biology is context dependent. Nothing has intrinsic meaning. It all depends on the context. And the context here is the hierarchical level of the comparison. 
So this is the legume of Dionyx regia. It's also it's an apomorphy for the leguminosae, uh, the Fabaceae. And it's also an example of the angiosperm carpal, a defining character for the clade angiosperms. So when we ask the question what this is, then the answer to that question is dependent on the taxonomic level of the comparison. So one of the things we were asking during our project was what, what this is. And uh, so this is, uh, at one level, Ipomoea batatas, uh, the, the sweet potato. So the sweet potato, uh, prior to our project, here, is, uh, here it is. Uh, it's, a ten, it's, it's always number seven, it's around about there in terms of top ten global food crops. Here it is here, the sister group is Ipomoea trifida. This is a comprehensive phylogeny of all the crop relatives, three of which uh, we, of the 14 we described in our, in our monograph. And um, Batatas is here, and none of these others have got a tuber. They've all got very normal roots. So the way the tuber has been seen is a sort of, it's been seen as an item of human domestication and seen as a sort of a global food crop, very important um, and uh, for uh, um, largely been selected for during, uh, during human domestication. So here's a phylogeny uh, and here's Ipomoea uh, batatas and here is, here's the crop relatives here, none of which have got tubers. But one of the things we were able to show is that there's 65 other species that have got tubers uh, right across the whole of Ipomoea. And here is uh, Batatas here, uh, one of these other species that have got tubers, mostly things in the Cerrado and other fire-prone places. Um, and uh, we also wanted to have a time uh, calibration on this. And most of these date back at least 5 million years. So this is the Ipomoea batatas, not only one of 65 independent evolutions and a convergent evolutionary nature of the, the root tuber, but um, evolving uh, part of a syndrome of things evolving tubers uh, that go back millions and millions of years, long outside any time frame for, uh, for human, human domestication. So that's quite a lot for a taxonomic project. And uh, had we not done the taxonomy, had we not got interested in batatas, then there was quite a few things that we wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have, because uh, uh, those were things that occurred to us as we were doing the project, rather than things that we decided beforehand. So just to finish off with the last two examples, uh, this is Ipomoea batatas here. The sweet potato, it's a hexaploid. It's got three pairs of chromosomes. Uh, Ipomoea trifida is its sister group. And we've shown because our phylogeny is comprehensive, so we've got every species in it. And people have always assumed this is an autopolyploid, uh, simple doubling up, not an allopolyploid when two different species come together. And so people have always been interested in this, a, a potential 4X progenitor of Ipomoea batatas. So the first observation we had, uh, this is bat uh, uh, batatas, this is, uh, is we started seeing in Herbaria a number of specimens from Ecuador that were labeled as Ipomoea batatas, but they didn't have the right calyx. And because we had spent so much time focused on the calyx, the differences were pretty slight, but they, were, they seemed important. <coughs> And this has only ever been known as a domesticated plant. No one knows what the wild form of this is. And these uh, uh, plants that had this slightly different calyx uh, from, uh, from Ecuador, the, um, they, were, they also seemed to be of wild providence. Uh, they, were, they, they didn't seem to be near agriculture. They seemed to be in wild places with other sort of plants that, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, of wild pro uh, provenance. Um, so we, you know, we, the first thing we did is, uh, and this is for any students, I see there's quite a lot of young, but I assume some of you are students. What I said to my PhD student, Tom Wells, I said, do not go into the herbaria and start measuring things. 
People have been looking at these things for 60 years and haven't been able to make sense of them. You have to do the sequencing. And what did he do? He went into this herbaria and measured all the characters and came up with these plots of 12 specimens, uh, t uh, 12 characters. So this is Batatas and tr this is uh, Ipomia trifida, sister group of sweet potato. This is sweet potato and this is the Ecuador 4X. Uh, I should say these things with these calyx also had were tetraploids. And the way that came about was that uh, we we, we noticed the calyx. We noticed the calyx was slightly different, and we asked you at the same time we were looking for tetraploids, and we asked USDA to send us any tetraploids they had. When we noticed uh, this calyx difference, they were from Esmeraldas in the northern department in Ecuador, and when USDA sent us their tetraploids, they were from uh, the coastal area of Esmeraldas in Ecuador, and we thought, goodness, are they the same things? Is that, the te is that the thing with a funny calyx? These tetraploids from USDA? And it turns out that's exactly what they were. And uh, our group just come back from Ecuador and uh, this, uh, this thing here is absolutely everywhere. Uh, they were really surprised. And uh, so this is morphology uh, showing it's very distinct. This is a linear discriminant analysis where you tell the, the, the intelligent program that uh, you've got three things and then uh, and see if it can find them, and it can find them absolutely fine and distinguish it nearly uh, with you know, huge efficiency of uh, discriminate this uh, new thing in Ecuador from Batatas and, uh, and Trifida. And we were able to sequence that and show that it's very distinct. And one of the complications here is that there's some hybrids. So we've got this 2X thing and 6X thing, and we were postulating a 4X intermediate progenitor but there's also 4Xs that come that are modern hybrids of 2X and 6X. So we had to discriminate between modern hybrid 4Xs and original progenitor 4Xs. And we were able to, to do that. And it's just been published uh, uh, very recently. Uh, it's got the... Uh, we, uh, one of the things that's happening as scientific teams get bigger and bigger and bigger is that the number of authorities on new species get longer and longer. And it's uh, totally daft. Uh, so these are the two students who are the authorities who did the basic work, who did, uh, got the name on this uh, uh, progenitor of the, uh, of, the, of the sweet potato. The first time a sweet potato, uh, the wild progenitor of it's been, uh, been discovered. All on the basis that we first started noticing a slight difference in the calyx. And just the last example is uh, one of the um, uh, people have been interested in pre-Columbian trans-oceanic contact theories. Um, so Christopher Columbus uh, sailed to America in 1400, 1490 or so, and um, that's seen as a great feat of navigation and, uh, and salesmanship, uh, uh, sailing ability. And uh, people have been interested in pre-Columbian, how much did the people get around the world before Columbus? And, uh, and one, of the, uh, one of the things that's often the examples is uh, the example of Polynesians uh, reaching South America. And the evidence for that was that the sweet potato, which is an American plant, was widespread in Polynesia when Europeans turned up in the 1500s. So there were people there about 1,000 years ago, 1100s. Uh, and then when Europeans came 1500, the sweet potato was everywhere. And what people have postulated, and that's seen as the best evidence, that Polynesians went to South America and took the sweet potato back, back with them. Um, there's every reason to question that idea, because they didn't take the potato or the tomato or lots of other things back with them. And what we were able to show is that as we were building this huge phylogeny, is we were able to show that Ipomias get around the world by long distance dispersal again and again and again and again. So we've got America with Australia sitting in the middle of it. All the Australian Ipomias are sitting in the nested in a big clade of American species. We have African species that have got a clade of American species in them. And we've got this example here of, this is Ipomia tuboides, which is uh, in Hawaii uh, uh, here which is, and it's, all its close relatives are in Mexico. So this is 5,200 kilometers. 
So you have uh, this plant here that's about a million years old. It's endemic to Hawaii, not found anywhere else, and all its close relatives are in Mexico. So the only satisfactory explanation for this is long distance dispersal, is that this group of Mexican things, a propicule, got to Hawaii and became this new species. So what we were able to say, and apparently upset the whole of New Zealand, <laughs> the, um, was that species of Ipomoea get around on their own steam by wind and water and birds and all of that, and it's quite commonplace. So there's no reason to invoke human transportation uh, when they can get around uh, uh, when they can get around so much on their own. And uh, this is one of the most recent uh, oceanic islands just off uh, uh, Tonga, uh, Hunga Tonga Haipe. It was responsible. It's disappeared now. It's responsible for tsunami last Christmas or so. And uh, this is it, a year after it came out, uh, the Pacific, this is Ipomoea uh, pesca pre, uh, ramifying through it, first uh, it and a, a species of owl were the first visitors uh, after a year of uh, the volcano coming out. And there's a whole number of other things that we've done. I won't have time to talk about those. We've got involved in time calibrated phylogenies. Uh, and we've also been, uh, I would recommend this species concept uh, paper um, uh, that we wrote, one of the things we were keen to do is reconcile the theory and practice of what a species is. Evolutionary biologists are more and more telling us now that species don't exist because uh, they're so complex and there's so many different types of species. But as taxonomists, we know that that's not really true. But we know it's a bit rough and ready around the edges. So one of the things we were trying to do is really bring together the idea of because we know species are real because we have species conservation programs, we have hotspots, we have latitudinal biodiversity gradients. So many generalizations about the natural world is based on the idea of a species. Um, but yet, they're complex. You get a gamal species, phylo species, hybrid species, all of that. So how do you get comparability among species at the same time as they're incredibly diverse? And uh, that's what our paper's about coming from the empirical work we did through the monograph. So I've spoken for far too long. And uh, just to uh, talk about the, the team, uh, this is John Wood, uh, someone I've worked with for over 30 years, uh, who did most of the specimen-based work. Tom Carruthers, uh, just gone to Michigan uh, for his second postdoc. He's been down at Kew Gardens, did all the time-calibrated stuff. Beth Williams built the ITS tree. Alex Sumajaya. Uh, worked on Ipomoea, funded by the Indonesian Academy of Sciences uh, on the Asian Ipomoeas. This is Tom Wells, um, who's currently in Ecuador trying to identify Loraceae that are eaten by the spectacled bears there. He's still just finishing his PhD and he gets to go and spend two months anywhere he wants. Uh, and uh, so he's currently uh, doing that. He said they've got compost toilets. It's heaven, was the email this morning. He's that sort of guy. He's building um, his own canoe without any power tools. He's uh, yeah, so sort of back to nature guy. But uh, he's uh, yeah, he's done a lot of the work on the on the progenitor. And this is Pablo Munoz, uh, who's been with me since his PhD, and then his uh, BBSRC postdoc on. Uh, on all the Ipomoea stuff, extraordinary individual from, from Madrid, uh, built all the trees and all of that. Because one of the things that we were doing as a bunch of taxonomists is we were really stretching out of our comfort zone. So we were having to learn a lot of stuff as we went along. Because one of the things that generally happens is the taxonomy gets done over here and these trees get built over here by very different people with very different expertise. And we were trying to put that together in a way that really worked. Uh, so they were, we were talking, to the whole time. Anyway, thanks, thanks very much. <laughs>